Hi everyone, welcome to my presentation. Today I want to talk about WASM as a plugin system to Rust, or the future of plugins with with BindGen. My name is Michael Mullen, and let's get into it. So, yo dog, I heard you like Rust. So I put some Rust in your Rust so you can Rust while you Rust. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? What is this? What am I talking about? I'm talking about making a plugin system where you can plug in WASM code into normal Rust binaries in order to add dynamic code um, at runtime rather than at compile time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick demo. Then I'm going to talk about why you would want to do this, um, why you would not want to do this, or at least not want to do this right now. And then I'll go through how to do this, but at a little bit of a high level, I'm going to gloss over a little bit. Um, and that's because the project with BindGen is brand new. And the example code that I'm going to give you today uh, is going to be stale in a few months. So today is May the 24th, 2022. Um, May the 24th, 2022. So, um, you know, if you come upon this video in September or in July, um, the code might not work for you and there might be up-to-date code that you need to, to, to research. Um, but anyways, yeah, this is a, a brand new project and it's very exciting. So I want to kind of get it out there and get it, uh, get you uh, um, enthused about it, give you some inspiration about some projects that you might want to do with it. And the last thing that we're going to talk about is kind of what's the performance penalty you pay when using WASM inside of Rust. So quick demo. What what am I what am I kind of showing off here? Well, I'm going to show off on the left side of my screen here. I have a a, a Rust Rust code that's going to be turned into native Rust na a native Rust binary. I also have two plugins. So this first plugin um, is just going to when it's given a, a string name a string as a name. It's going to say hello and whatever that string is. And then I have one more plugin that will, it has the same function signature. Um, so when it gets a, a, a name as a string, it's going to report out, hello, good sir, if the name is equal to Michael. But if the name is not equal to Michael, it's going to say, I don't know you, and then the name. So it's pretty simple here. Um, don't worry about this second function. I'm going to get to that uh, a little later on in the video. So let me run it and let me show you how it works. So as you can see, um, the first function is running. So the first function here, it comes from our first guest. Um, and it just spits out, hello, Michael, or hello, Douglas. But the second function spits out, hello, good sir, Michael or I don't know you, Douglas. Um, so it's pretty simple, you know, um, it's a hello world little application here, but the code it's running is from dynamic um, plugins here. It's, it's running code from WASM rather than native code. And that WASM code is being loaded at runtime rather than, rather than compile time. So again, what is this? Um, why are we doing this? Um, normal WASM has a very li limited amount of types that it can use. In fact, there's only four types. There is 32-bit um, integers, 64-bit integers, 32-bit floats, and 64-bit floats. And that's it. That's all you've got. Everything else needs to be built up from those. So complex types like structures or even strings are unavailable and you, unless you want to do the work of converting those strings into, um, into marshalling and unmarshalling those strings. So what do I mean by marshalling and un unmarshalling? So let's say you've got an ASCII string and you want to pass that act ASCII string into WASM code. What you need to do um, is take that ASCII string, um, take an area of the WASM memory, um, and then start copying in byte by byte each character in the ASCII string into the WASM memory. You then 
get a wasm function where you input the starting point of the string and the ending point of the string. So that, that's what I mean by marshalling. The, the, um, the wasm code then goes, okay, um, I have been given the starting point of the string and the ending point of a string, so I am then able to unmarshal all of the code, um, all of that string inside of my code. Um, then to export a string, what you would need to do is you would need to um, take the string that you're going to export, so in my case, the hello, Michael, um, you need to take you need to copy in the hello Michael into the WASM memory locations and then return the starting point of that string and the ending point of that string. But of course you can't return two things here. You can't return a tuple. So what we would need to do is set aside um, an area in the WASM memory that would contain the starting point and the ending point, And then we return the location in the WASM memory to our native code. Our native code then goes and looks up. Um, it then looks in the WASM memory, sees the starting point and the ending point of the WASM memory of the hello Michael string, and that's how it knows how to deal with that string. So that's kind of a lot of a lot of work to do here, and we want someone else to do that for us. So what can do that work for us? Well, which bind gen does that work for us? But there are alternatives. So there is wasm bind gen. The thing about wasm bind gen is it's for the Rust to JavaScript in a browser ecosystem. So the bindings that it creates are specific to, um, so when you create your wasm, it compiles up your wasm, but it also creates bindings so that JavaScript can use that um, WASM code in a browser environment. There is also another project called fpbindgen. Now fpbindgen is made by a company called Fiberplane. Um, and they say um, what, what fpbindgen does is it's specific to Rust, to WASM, to Rust again. Um, but what we want um, eventually, what we want is an any code to WASM to any code, and that's what WIT bind gen is going to provide for us. And in fact, what the, um, the fiber plane guys say is that we do believe interface types to be the future of WASM bindings, but for the short term, FP bind gen provides bindings that will worth, that will work with a stable serialization format. And what they mean by um, WASM bindings is the WASM interface types proposal as defined by WIT bindgen. So they believe that WIT bindgen is the future, but for their, their project right now, they need something right now to work right now. So they've come up with FP bindgen. But yeah, they believe that WIT bindgen is going to be the future too. So what, what is WITBindGen? WITBindGen is a library based on WASM time. And WASM time, both WASM time and WITBindGen are projects of the Bytecode Alliance. Most of the code for this WITBindGen comes from a fellow named Alex Crichton. And he is an extremely prolific Rust developer. Um, the code that he's written and put up on crates.io has been downloaded billions of times. And if we um, if we take a look at his um, so one of the projects that he is involved in is log. So if we go through here, we can see Alex Crichton, and then we're going to look at all of his all of his all all of his all times downloads by number of number of downloads here, and we will see that he has provided us code into the RAND crate, which has 100 million downloads, RAND core, again, another 100 million, libc, 100 million, config if, 100 million, bit flags, nearly 100 million, log, nearly 100 million, regex, nearly 100 million, you know, on and on and on. This guy's, 
this guy's code is in your code if you are uh, writing if you are writing Rust code. Um, so yeah, it's done by someone who knows what he's doing. Um, what bit what WitBindGen allows you to do is to write contracts or otherwise known as protocols in a Wit language, a WASM interface type language. And it's very similar to protobufs. And in fact, one of the criticisms I have for WitBindGen is why didn't they just use protobufs? Um, the marshalling and unmarshalling problem, although the implementations are going to be different, different the problem and therefore the protocol um, is extremely similar. So I'm wondering why they didn't just use the, the dot proto files from protobuf to do the same sort of work. Um, but anyways, they've probably got their reasons. Um, a fellow who's had his code downloaded billions of times might know the, um, the, the, the problem sphere uh, a little bit better than I do. So yeah, uh, um, you, you write your contracts in a WIT language. And then languages using um, the WIT bind gen libraries can then implement these contracts, allowing for consistent complex types to be passed between languages and WASM. So what developers will do is they will write export and import contracts and implementations for those contracts. What an export is, is it's um, WASM or also known as guest code, a guest function that can be run by the host. Um, another way of putting that is WASM, which is run in native code. They can also write import functions, which is an import is native, also known as host functions, that can be run by the guest. Um, another way of saying that is native code run in WASM. So the, the reason why you would want to write like an import function is to, to, is to provide helpers. So um, if with WASM, one of the promises that WASM gives you is that you can lock down your WASM inside of the runtime so that your WASM code can't open up random files or access the network or just make random system calls. But what you can do is provide helper functions, even though your WASM is locked down, to do some, some stuff. So your WASM code will call your native code, which opens up a logging file and logs, does logging for you, that sort of thing. Even though your WASM is locked down tight, it calls the helper function to access logging, that sort of thing. Um, so why would you want to do this plugin system at all? Well, my first use case for you is that um, you want to add functionality to a long running program. If you have some sort of code which can't be brought down for a recompile whenever you've got a new feature that you want to add, you can use this plugin system to dynamically add new features to your long running program. So for example, um, you've got security monitoring software and this security monitoring software, um, your a company has a mandate that the monitoring software must always be run if there is an ethernet cable plugged in to um, what it's, what it's um, securely monitoring. So, in order to add a new feature to the security monitoring software, what you would need to do is go to the system, unplug the ethernet cable, then update your software, run your software again, and then plug the ethernet cable back in. So that means that there's a lot of downtime because you have to get a guy to go do all that work for you. When you've got a plugin system, you can dynamically add new features to this um, long running program so you don't have to go unplug the ethernet cable, recompile, rerun, plug the ethernet cable back in. Um, another kind of idea would be that you're a, a, a web host and you've got one giant server which is going to run the code for all of your clients, so for all of your customers. And what your customers will provide you with is WASM backends that generate the, their web pages and and do all their web work. 
<clears throat> so um, what you don't want to bring down that web server every time you've got a new client. And of course, you don't want clients to just kind of run random software on your machine. Um, so luckily, we've got Wasm. So you plug you plug your client's code into your your web host, and this makes sure that your um, your web host is nice, nice and secure because you only give your clients the permissions that they're allowed via Wasm, and um, you don't have to bring up and down your your single web server here. Um, just an idea. What's another reason to do this? To add functionality from untrusted sources into applications that you're running. So um, due to the security and performance promises of Wasm, this method of doing a Wasm plugins can be faster and or safer than integrating, say, Lua code, uh, <clears throat> integrating Java code, or integrating dynamic libraries into your programs. So an example is a text editor like Vim or VS Code. Um, what they do, uh, what VS Code does is I believe it uses JavaScript plugins and you plug in some JavaScript code to do your, your, your stuff with, with VS Code. Um, the way that NeoVim works is you um, inject some Lua code that can do stuff. Um, Vim allows you to do some Vim code to do stuff. Now these plugins that you're putting into these, these text editors can actually call out to external binaries. That's dangerous, but it's, it's, it's also useful. So for example, if you're a Vim user and you, you write Vim with Rust and you've got um, COC plugins to do um, um, Rust analyzer stuff, what is going on here is that um, the Vim language, uh, either if it's NeoVim or whatever, it's it's calling out to um, the Rust analyzer binary, which is a separate binary on your disk. Now, technically, that binary can do whatever it wants. So if that Rust, um, Rust analyzer was compromised, instead of analyzing your, your software, your code, it could just delete your code. If you were to use a Wasm plugin, you can make sure that it's not allowed to, to do that sort of stuff. So you can bu build your Wasm plugin to analyze your code um, by giving it the actual source code in the, in the plugin. Um, and then the plugin analyzes the code and returns to you information about the source code. Another um, way of doing it is, is plugins to a web browser like Firefox. Um, or Chrome or something like that, instead of injecting JavaScript stuff, which isn't as performant as Wasm, you can inject Wasm, which is more performant. Um, desktop plugins can be done this way. Um, GNOME or KDE can use this sort of stuff rather than JavaScript um, to, do, to do its plugin system so that it's, the plugins are more performant. Now, the, my third use case is to make your plugin system multi-language supported. So for example, um, GNOME, instead of being solely reliant on developers writing JavaScript plugins, um, the developers can write their programs in Go or in, or in JavaScript or in C or in Python or whatever language that you can com compile down into WASM. Um, so you can, you can enable a lot of a lot more developers to be able to, to to develop your your to develop plugins for your application um, and that's one of the reasons why you would want to use was so why would you not want to do this or not want to do this right now using witbindgen witbindgen is pre-alpha code it's not even on crates.io yet um, in order to use witbindgen you actually have to uh, use Git repositories to grab the library. It's that it's 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 that new right now. Um, there's also no real examples, um, and that's one of the reasons why I want to do this video is to give you an example, to give you a little bit of a walkthrough in a, of an example that I'm that I'm going to show you. Um, but yeah, uh, other other than my code and uh, on um, there is an issue opened on Witbindgen 
that gives you another example of example code. Um, but yeah, other than these two things, there's there's nothing out there for you to to kind of learn from. So if you can't learn about a library, it's kind of hard to use a library. Um, so yeah, it is pre-alpha, which means that the code needs some more refactoring. Um, and in order to use the libraries, there's some nasty boilerplate that you have to do that I'm going to show you, but gloss over in, in the, the kind of code walkthrough that I'm going to, that I'm going to give. Um, also with bind gen, because they're not yet at their optimization stage, it's not nearly as performant as it, as you would like. It's still pretty fast, right? You're not going to, um, I don't think you're going to notice all that much slowdown right now, but it's certainly a lot slower than native, native Rust. Um, and of course, um, the promise that I'm giving you right now is that you can go from any code to WASM to any code. Um, but right now, WitBindGen only allows you to compile to WASM code using Rust or C, and it only allows you to run uh, to in, in, import that WASM code using Rust, JavaScript, or Python. Um, so it's not at the any code to WASM to any code stage quite yet. Um, also, um, this is kind of a duh um, concept, but if you don't need a plugin architecture, don't use a plugin architecture. If if you don't have the security concerns, if you don't if you don't mind. Um, opening up random files on your hard drive or um, your plugins uh, accessing the network or or doing whatever the plugins want to do. Um, if you don't have these security concerns, then don't use um, a bytecode architecture plugin uh, because bytecode will always be slower than native machine code. Um, but yeah, often security is a concern. So if security is a concern, then WASM is a good choice going forward. So how do we do this? So again, I'm going to take a little bit of a high level approach here because the code that I'm going to demonstrate is going to go stale in a few months. Um, but I still want to give you some flavor about uh, how to do this right now and inspire you to kind of go out and start writing your programs with plugins and stuff like that right now. Um, so yeah, how you do this is first you write a WIT contract. You then write a WASM implementation for the contract. You then write code to ingest that con uh, contract in native code, and you let WIT bind gen do its magic. So let me kind of go through in depth the demo that I just gave um, earlier. So what we're doing here is in our native native Rust code, we are going to take um, these WASM files and pass them into an instantiate function. Now, this is what I meant by it's a little bit gnarly and it needs to be a little bit refactored here. This instantiate function is going to do, it's going to build up a WASM time runtime, which will run our WASM code. Um, so when you're building up your WASM time uh, runtime, you're going to take that WASM code and um, build it up using WASM time. Um, you're then going to kind of do some magic here with WASM time and, and whip bind gen. <coughs> Excuse me to do all the, all the work that you need to do. And again, I'm glossing over this um, because I think that this boilerplate code inside of the instantiate function won't be needed in the future because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a, 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 a difficult ask to ask library users to implement all this boilerplate code. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we're building up the, um, we're building up the, the WASM time runtime. We're, we're grabbing the WASM code uh, that is stored right now on our hard drive um, and importing that into WASM time to be able to use at a later date. That later date will then be practically immediately. And we will then 
after we get the functions from the instantiate call, we will then um, use them right here. Um, so assuming that the functions are all good and they all work properly, um, you can then call them. And this name here comes from my runner where I'm passing in Michael or Douglas. Um, after, after we get the result from that wasm hello call, and again, to show you what that code is, it's, it's right there. Um, after we get that string, um, I'm just going to print it out. Easy as that. And again, it works because, um, because this wasm code um, implements a WIT contract. So what is a WIT contract and what does it look like? This is a WIT contract. Um, what you're saying here is that you have a thing called hello. And what that thing is, is a function. And what it takes is a string named name. And what it returns, what the function returns, is a string. And this, this wit contract um, is ruled by a grammar. And this grammar you can find on the, the witbindgen GitHub page. Um, so if you go into the wit, witbindgen GitHub page um, and then click on the wit.markdown file, it goes through the grammar. So you can find out what your, your keywords are, um, how you fit things together, how functions look, um, that sort of that sort of thing. How enums are, unions are, how functions look, and that sort of thing. Um, so you can find it all that information about how you build your 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 wit file. Um, so yeah, um, your library, your your native code. This is the ingestion code, and again, um, I hope this ingestion code. Will, will be abstracted for you by the library at a future date. Um, but here is an example for you to use right now if you want to start writing plugins right now. Now, our WASM code um, uses WITBINDGEN and um, it, it imports that WIT code and the wit code's name is called say here. And I have a structure called say. And so I'm going to implement say say for my structure say. Uh, it's a little bit easier than, than saying it aloud. Um, basically, you're just, you're just implementing um, functions for your wit file um, and it, it is kind of based on the name of the wit file that's kind of the the point i'm trying to get across here um, but yeah w once you kind of get over that kind of weirdness there you're just writing a really you're just writing a rust function and it will get turned into wasm code and it will be able to marshal and unmarshal the name that you pass into it and then it will be able to marshal and unmarshal the string that it returns from, that it returns to the native code. Uh, so yeah, l let me run this one more time and we can see it in all its glory and it works great. Um, so yeah, the next thing that you'll be asking yourself is how slow is it? And like I said, uh, WITBINDGEN is not yet in the optimization phase, so things are quite a bit slower. Um, the full path of calling, of, of marshalling, so again, to, to show you what's going on here, um, we are marshalling the name, which is Michael. We are marshalling this name here. Um, then we are calling our WASM code. Then we are unmarshalling Michael. We are then using the code in there to generate a string called hello Michael. And that's marshaled into the, the WASM memory area. And then 
we pass that out to native code, which then unmarshals it. Um, and then that is the, the full round trip that I speak of that is 20 times slower. That is the full path that is 20 times slower. Um, the actual WASM code is about five times slower. And what do I mean by the actual WASM code here? Um, what I mean by the actual WASM code is this, this, this single call actually. And this is why I've got this overhead uh, function. This overhead function is going to um, take a poor man's um, benchmark of this specific call. So it doesn't include the marshalling and unmarshalling of the name, and it doesn't include the marshalling and unmarshalling of the return string. It only looks at the actual work being done internal to the function. And that seems to be about five times slower. So I've, I've got a little, um, I've got some code here that, that kind of demos this, um, that shows this off. So I'm, I'm calling this overhead function just exactly the same way that I'm calling the hello function, but overhead is returning um, the amount of time that happens to run that format macro. Um, and I'm doing the same thing, except in native code down here. So if I go down here, you can see that this native code is exactly the same thing as the, the code that will be turned into WASM. And if I run this using release mode, so I'm going to make run rel, you're gonna, uh, uh, so I'm gonna iterate over this 10 million times, 10 million times both doing the WASM calls and 10 million times doing the native calls. And we'll see kind of what the, uh, the timing difference is in with some poor man's, ben poor man's benchmarking. So what we can see here is that the full um, marshalling, unmarshalling, doing the, the code, then unmarshalling -mar and unmarshalling again takes um, around 1500 nanoseconds per iteration over this, over this loop. So every, every iteration over this, over this call right here, um, takes on average around, uh, 1500 nanoseconds. While in the native code, that same sort of loop only takes 81 nanoseconds. So it's a considerable... Um, the WASM code is a considerable amount slower than the native code, but the actual internal, um, internal to um, the functions, uh, in WASM it takes 330 seconds, uh, 37 nanoseconds, and 44 nanoseconds. And the reason, the reason why I'm harping on about this, is because the marshalling and the unmarshalling of these functions is taking up the majority of the time because the functions themselves are extremely small and tight. But if you had a very large function, if your WASM code was doing a whole lot of work, um, the full round trip would not be 18 times slower. It wouldn't be 20 times slower. You'd get, um, you'd get closer to this seven times slower. Kind of idea as the code inside of WASM um, takes up more of the instruction set than the unmarsh than the marshaling and the unmarshaling stuff. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we're at right now. Um, so yeah, I hope um, I know I'm giving you a library which is brand new that you can't even get on crates.io. But this really is the future for, for plugin architectures, especially with Rust. Um, and I hope I've inspired you to kind of think about different ways that you can start plugging in WASM code into not just, um, not just browser stuff, not to just into um, frameworks in the browser, not into just speeding up JavaScript, but to doing kind of really interesting work to load up dynamic dynamic code into your your rust projects 
in order to do interesting things that you can't normally do if you're limiting yourself to what you do at compile time. Um, so yeah, I hope I've inspired you. I hope you've learned a thing, a thing or two about Rust and about Wasm. And I hope you have a good morning, a good evening, or a good afternoon. Thank you.